Well, many scientists believe that we haven't fully tapped into the potential of the human brain. Uh, You may have seen studies like this over the years. At one point, they actually said that the human brain, that we only use about 10% of our brain. And uh, studies come and go, and sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, so I don't really know. Uh, But I think it's safe to say that we don't use our full capacity of our brain. Scientists are able to figure that out. And as scientists study the brain and its power, it's captured our imagination. Uh, There's been movies that have been made about the power of the human mind. You might have seen some of these. And what can happen when someone almost miraculously taps into the other 90%. This other hidden part of our brain that we don't tap into, what can happen? Uh, Some of them are pretty fantastic in these movies. The movie The Matrix is themed around this idea, a similar idea, that our brain believes something, it can do it. That it can bend things, it can do all sorts of things. And we see this play out in real life as well. As we continue to study the brain, there's therapies that are built around helping people understand how to use their brain uh, to, to understand new things and to think differently, to almost change our behavior. And I don't know about all of that and how much potential we have to use our brain, but I do know this, that what we believe determines how we behave. That what we believe in our mind, and as last week we learned in our hearts, determines how we behave. A great example of this is the four-minute mile. Uh, For the longest time, people have been fascinated with, with going fast. Uh, and for not just in cars or in vehicles, but the human body. And in the mid 1800s, uh, we were able to actually measure speed. And throughout all these tests, they would try to figure out how fast can a human go. And for the longest time, it was believed that it was physically impossible for a human being to travel, to run faster, to run a mile, no faster than four minutes. That nobody could run a mile faster than four minutes. It just couldn't be done. And for years, People believe this. And for years, nobody could. Nobody could run a mile faster than four minutes. People would come close, really close, but never would they run a mile faster than four minutes because they understood it just can't be done. Their brain just said it's physically impossible. That was until Roger Bannister did it in 1954. Now, he believed it was possible, so he did it. And then something pretty amazing happened. Lots of other people started to do it too. All of a sudden, people believed they could do it. Now, what changed? Uh, Was it that we had better sneakers or some kind of new training regimen? No, they just simply believed it could be done. Now, all sorts of people run a mile in less than four minutes. I mean, I don't, but a lot of people do. Maybe some of you do. Because what we believe determines how we behave. And Paul knew this, the Apostle Paul. We've seen over the last three chapters of Ephesians how Paul wants us to understand some things about ourselves. So he spent the first half of the letter telling us who we were, who we are. Because if we believe the right thing about ourselves in our head and in our hearts, then we know how to behave. Because what we believe determines how we behave. So we ended chapter three last week and Paul was pleading to God that we would get it. Remember that that we would know it, not just in our head, but in our heart, that we would know who God has made us to be. It affects our decisions that we make, what we believe about ourselves. And Paul wants us to know that in Christ, we can beat the four-minute mile. So today we're going to look at chapter four. If you've got your Bibles, open up to Ephesians chapter four. And as usual, we have a handout again this week. I encourage you to look at those discussion questions, those study guide during the week. And on the other side is some of that passage. It's chapter four. But I made a change this week as I was going through this. So we're actually going to cover chapter four all the way through verse 21 of chapter five. And unless I wanted to make that micro print, it wasn't going to fit on that piece of paper. So you have chapter four on your paper, but if you want to follow along with us in chapter five, I encourage you to open up your Bible. So let's start in chapter four, first verse. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. If you're reading a different translation, it might've started off and said, therefore, And if you've been around church long enough, you've heard this before, that when you see the word therefore, you should look to see what it's there there for. Yeah. So he says, therefore, because of all the great things I told you about who you are, live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Live worthy. 
Live worthy. Now, the Bible Knowledge Commentary says that the Greek word for this is actually translated for worthy, is translated axios. And it's where we get our English word axiom. And it means to be of equal weight. See, in the equation, the axiom indicates doing something on each side of the equation to make it true. And so Paul's saying we should try to live our lives equal to the greatest blessing, equal to the calling that we have. Equal to all those great blessings that we saw in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, that's how we're supposed to live, worthy. So what does it mean to live worthy? He's not saying that you need to earn it, that you should, because of what Christ did now, you must live worthy. He's saying because of who you are, because of what you know. Paul spends the rest of this chapter and into chapter five showing us what it looks like to live worthy in axiom, in balance with who we are. And right off the bat, Paul starts swinging for the fences. He says this in verse two, be completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing with each other in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. See, in that culture, being humble, gentle, patient, these weren't noble things that people aspired to. It was actually a sign of weakness to live this way. They weren't character traits that the Ephesians would have strived for. And right out of the gate, Paul's saying, listen, to live worthy is gonna look different. To live worthy of your calling, balanced with who you are in Christ, your life is gonna look different. And he calls us again to unity and peace. Now, peace is a tough word for us in today's culture. We often think of peace as the absent of conflict. And there's a famous quote that's sometimes attributed to Ronald Reagan, sometimes it's Gandhi or Nelson Mandela, but this is the quote, is that peace is not the absence of conflict, it's the ability to handle conflict by peaceful means. See, in other words, Paul isn't directing us as Christians, as Christ followers, to keep the peace. That's not what he's saying. That's making everyone happy letting everybody get their way. That's not real peace. Paul's saying, let this unity, this bond of peace be in all your interactions, in love. And how you do that is by what he said, gentleness, patience, humbleness. It's often said that love is the oil of our relationships. That's how you keep the peace, to have love. Unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Then Paul talks about how out of this peace, this unity, some things are gonna change. We're gonna work together. We get another illustration. Paul's got lots of different metaphors throughout this passage. And this section of scripture is full of them. So he starts to talk about the unity that we have as a body. Verse 11, he says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service. So the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now you might see some similarities to this passage to a passage you might've been familiar with in 1 Corinthians. We often refer to it as one body, many parts. And Paul here lists off some different positions And this list isn't exhaustive. This isn't all the parts of the body. Actually, it looks like Paul is really focusing in here on church leaders. And we're not gonna look at all of these this morning and teach through them, but there's apostles and prophets. We've seen that mentioned in chapter two earlier when we learned about this new life that we have in Christ. The apostles were those who had firsthand experience and knowledge of Jesus. And evangelists, he said, those are people whose life passion is to share the gospel publicly with the whole world. And then he says, pastors or shepherds, your Bible might say, and teachers. That's people like me and like our staff who are called and sometimes are calling, but maybe are in our career to help lead God's people, to help teach God's people. And what are all these positions for? For all these people that we just listed to carry out the mission of God, right? No, that's not what those people are for. The pastors and elders and church staff here, we're not supposed to do the ministry, right? I hate to break it to you, that's not what it says. 
That's not my job. That's your job. Let's look at this. It's not, the, it's not Dan's job. It's not Matt's job or Alex or any of our elders. It's not our job to do the ministry. We have a great staff who does great things in the name of Jesus, but we have a job description here in Ephesians. Paul says it's my job to equip his people for works of ministry. So that the body of Christ, that's the church, that's us, may be built up. My job, our job as a staff and a leadership here at Seymour Christian Church is to equip you. Paul says that living a life worthy is to use your gifts, to be equipped for ministry, that we all have a part to play. He's saying that we all have to show up. We all have to be part of the body. We have to show up and be equipped. That's what helps us reach the fullness of Christ, as we talked about last week. Now he goes on to tell us that when we're all playing our role in the body, then we'll start to grow and mature. And we won't be swayed by what the world tells us. As each pot body part does its job in love, that's how we grow. This is how we're going to grow up. This is what it looks like to be mature. Now, I want to speak candidly for a second. And I'm sorry if this is your first time with us or you're a guest. We have some insider talk here for a moment. Now, most of you know that I'm new here, and I've been so encouraged by so many of you saying how glad you are that our family is here. I really appreciate that. I'm so excited to see what God has in store for us all. But I've heard, good, now we can get down to ministry. Now we can get going. Now it's going to get better. Now we can get to work. And I understand the sentiment, but let me be clear. Seymour Christian Church isn't going to be a place where any of that happens because of me or our great staff. We're not going to be a church that's successful for his name and for his glory because of me, because of my ministry, but your ministry. God working through you. We saw just a hint of that this morning in that video of God working through you. My role, our role as a church leadership is to help equip you, to teach you how to have that power, how to live worthy, not to be the power. My job is to equip you. See, as a church, we're not gonna be a place to come to get ministry or for the staff to do ministry, but a place for you to come to be equipped for you to do ministry. Paul says that living a life worthy is to use your gifts to show up and that we all have a part to play. Let's look at verse 14 and 15. He says, then you will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every word of teaching. And he goes on, he says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Paul says that we've got to show up. We've got to play our part in the body, but then we also need to grow up. We've got to mature. We've got to grow up. And Paul lays out some specifics of what it means to live differently, to grow up, to mature in Christ. He goes on, he says, in verse 20, that, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by his deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitudes of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. See, he warns the Ephesians, you can't be like the world. He reminded them of this because of who they are in Christ were to put off, or your, your translation might say, take off your old self. And Paul's once again here mixing metaphors. He's talking about clothes, maybe taking on and putting off. He says to put off the old self, take off the old clothes, take off the old you. That's the clothes that you wore when you were dead. He talked about that in chapters one and two. Back before when you were dead, we sang about that this morning, the grave clothes that we take off and put on the new self, he tells us. He says, you're supposed to be wearing something different. And then he spends the rest of this time telling us what this new self looks like in this chapter and the rest of chapter five and chapter six. In verse 25, he says, 
Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we're all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. He's saying, be people whose words and your actions ring true. Control your temper. Don't give Satan a foothold. Now, what does that mean? If our anger is nursed or fed, it also becomes personal. And that hatred, it dwells within us. And Jesus warns us in the Sermon on the Mount that that anger leads to wrath. And it isn't so much just going on on the inside, it's something that comes on the outside. But what's going on the inside, we learn in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that anger is like you're murdering someone. Frederick Buechner said this. He said, of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor to the last to some morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you're wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. It says, gotta stop. Don't let your anger give way to sin. If you steal, he says, stop it. Don't take what isn't yours. Instead, give to those who are in need. He's not just trying to correct behavior. He's saying, remember, there's a balance here because of who you are. Live a life worthy. So don't just steal, but give to those who need. Rise to the level of your position. He goes on and he gives us several more attributes of this new self in verse 29. He says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit, he says. And then he goes on and he says, don't live sexual immoral lives. And he says, not a hint. There should not be a hint of unwholesome talk, not a hint of sexual immorality. Those are your old clothes. Take them off and put on something new. Bitterness, he says. Take off bitterness. Uh, Warren Wearsby said this. He said, bitterness leads to wrath, which is the explosion on the outside, the feelings on the inside. Once again, those things, those old clothes, take them off. This is what it means to grow up to be mature. That old self, that was a baby. Paul wants us to grow up. He's saying, guys, you were once like this, but now you're called to something else. You're called to live a life worthy of these amazing blessings that you've been given. Remember, we didn't get this position because of what we did, because we live this way. Jesus gave us these blessings before we did anything to deserve or not to deserve them. But because of what Christ has done, live worthy. Don't let there be a hint of unwholesome talk. That one's a big one for us, I think, because we often think it just means swear words. That, it's so much more than that. He says, don't say anything that doesn't build others up. Think about the language that you use the things that you say about each other, the things that you say about people next to you, the people you say, the things you say about people in this room, people that you've had confrontation with. Is what you're saying, does it build them up? That's a reality check for me. Does everything that come out of my mouth, does it build others up? Because Paul's saying anything else is unwholesome talk. He says in verse eight, he says, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live or walk as children of light. Live it out. Now, Paul has a mixed metaphor here. He says, he says the fruit of that light is goodness, righteousness, and truth. And you might say, wait a minute, how does light have a fruit? 
He's using an example here. The, the outcome, the result of living in the light is goodness, righteousness, and truth. He says, find out what pleases the Lord and do it. That's what it means to grow up, to mature in Christ. It's this Bible word we've been using every week. You've heard it, sanctification. It's the process of being more like Christ, of taking off those clothes and putting on those new ones. And it's a process. It doesn't just happen because remember, we're trying to grow up. We're trying to mature. I don't know about you, but I know that there's a long period of time, several years, when I was going from adolescence to adulthood. It just didn't happen. It wasn't like I woke up one morning and everything was different. It was a process. And our life with Jesus, it's even longer. It takes a lifetime for us. And that's why you might have been here, you might be here, and this might be like you're just searching, you're just started a relationship with Jesus. Or you might have been a Christ follower for decades and we're all in process. No matter whether you just accepted Jesus as your savior or you've been walking with Christ for years, you've got to look at yourself. Is there even a hint of any of things in my life? Am I living a life worthy of the calling? This growing up, it's a process. Now, it's sometimes easy to look at this list of attributes that Paul has here things we're supposed to be taking off and the things we're supposed to be putting on, and especially the things that we're taking off, and look at them and think, uh, that's impossible. How can I let no unwholesome talk? How can I have not a hint of sexual immorality? Or maybe, for most of us in here, we look at that list and we think, he must be talking about somebody else. We just breeze by it. Well, I'm not sexually immoral. Are you? Is there anything in your life that isn't worthy, living a life worthy of the calling. I don't swear. I don't. Is there any unwholesome talk from your mouth? Or is everything you say build others up? I don't have an anger problem. Really? There aren't relationships in your life that you've allowed conflict to take over? It's tough for us. We, we read lists like this and we think it must, Paul must be talking about someone else. But remember, Paul's saying, because of what you know, because of who you are, this is how you're supposed to live. This is living a life worthy. Now, I have some homework for you this week. And this one's gonna be tough. And I'm not gonna do this, or I'm going to do this too. I wouldn't ask you to do something that I'm not gonna do. If you might be thinking, I don't know, I don't know where I fall in this list here. I don't know what I need to work on. Ask somebody. I know, this is gonna be tough. But I want you to take out this passage and maybe ask your spouse. Read through this together. Where do you see anger taking hold of me? Bitterness, selfishness. Where do you see a hint of sexual immorality? We're not living up to those standards that God has called us. Where is unwholesome talk seeping through in my life? That's a tough thing. Ask your spouse. Ask those people that you live with. And I'm going to do that. I'm not going to share what's told to me, to you, but I encourage you to do that. Be willing to ask those close to you, where do you see this in my life? Help me to be more worthy of the calling that I've received. So you see this question up here on the screen. Are my thoughts, actions, and behaviors equal to the calling I've received? Are they worthy of who Christ has made me to be? Paul says we've got to show up. We've got to play our part in the body of Christ. We've got to grow up. We've got to live differently. We've got to walk differently. We've got to talk differently. We've got to show up. We've got to grow up. And we've got to wake up. Some of those in the church in Ephesus needed to wake up they were in the dark. He says in verse 13, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Wake up, O oh sleeper. Some of us need to get ourselves out of bed, turn on the lights and wake up. Now, Paul's quoting something here. You can probably see that in your passages in verse 14. And we don't really know exactly 
what he's quoting. It maybe it was a song or a phrase that they used often. Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We sang a lot about that this morning in these songs, that we would take off those grave clothes. We would wake up, and Christ would shine on you, that we'd wake up, we'd rise from the dead. See, light is the ultimate cleanser. Light has the power to heal. Light reveals what is hidden. And Paul says, you, that light, it has the power to scatter evil. Now, I don't know if you had this experience, if you had kids. Uh, I, we have children when they were younger, and we'd have bedtime, and they're supposed to be in their beds quietly. And then we'd hear this mm, the rustle. We knew something was going on in there. We open the door, we turn the lights, and they scatter, right? <laughs> like just run to the bed. Kids do that because they were caught because light reveals and it causes us to scatter to see how things are supposed to be. Psalm 119 says, light makes the path clear. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Have you ever had one of those rechargeable night lights? Or sometimes if you put them outside and you might go out there and say, well, the, it's not lit up. Maybe it was a cloudy day and your outside light isn't on. And it's because it, it wasn't in the light long enough. It wasn't exposed to the light. And Paul here, he's saying, everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. If we want our light to shine, we have to be in the light. Wake up. Turn on the lights and Christ will shine on you. Christ will shine through you. In verse 15, Paul says this. He says, be careful as he ends this. He says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You have to show up. You have to be part of the body of Christ. We have to grow up. We've got to mature. We've got to wake up. And this last part here, Paul tells us, you have to wise up. We have to live a life worthy. He says, you know who you are. You know the life that you've been called to. Your actions, your behaviors, your reactions and choices, those are to be in balance with who God has made you to be. If you believe all these things that Paul has said in these first three chapters of Ephesians, then you can do all the things. You can live a life worthy of the calling. You can live up to all the things that he says in chapter four, five, and six. Because what we believe about ourselves determines how we behave. And if you believe you can run a four-minute mile, you can train to do it. If we believe who we are in Christ, we can live this way. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. We might have to have those uncomfortable conversations with each other to help each other. But we can live a life worthy of your calling. In Christ, if we show up and grow up and wake up and wise up. Let's pray together. God, what a powerful passage and challenging in so many ways as we look at our own lives and we can see where we often aren't living that way. We aren't living worthy of the calling that you've called us to. God, forgive us for that. Forgive me for that. And God, may we search in our own lives this week ways that we're falling short of that, not so that we can earn something, but so that we can rise, that we can live in a balanced relationship with what you've called us to that our life can rise to be worthy of the position that we have. God, may those unwholesome talk, may it get out of our lives. Convict us of those jokes that we say, those things that we do, the stuff that we let into our hearts, the way we treat each other. God, may we be people who are taking that off and putting on the light of Christ. We'd be clothed with you and you alone. God, I... I thank you for calling us by name, for calling to each and every one of us and making a way for us, for pulling us out of the grave and giving us life. And Lord, we celebrate that here today. 
We celebrate the life that we can have in you, the position that we have in you. God, you called us by name. You called us by name and you called us to be a light to this world, to have your light shine on us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church together said, amen. Let's stand together and worship.